Start. Okay, time to start. Okay, so today we have the great pleasure of having here Vicky Meadows who is a professor of astronomy and the director of the astrobiology program at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, uh, she's also the principal investigator of the NASA Astrobiology Institute Virtual Planetary uh, Laboratory. Uh, Vicky uh, did her degrees in Australia uh, in physics uh, at the University of uh, New South Wales and then uh, at the University of Sydney for her PhD. So then she moved on and uh, uh, her main um, accomplishments uh, for our community of astrobiologists is the creation of VPL, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory, because that combined not only her insights and work on modeling planets, planetary atmospheres, but the insights of a whole group of people that defined and in a certain sense redefined how do we connect the planetary environment to the conditions for life and then to the search for life, uh, particularly with direct help to all the instrumentation, equipment, telescopes and instrumentation. So that's uh, partly uh, and very significantly um, why she received the uh, 2018 Drake uh, Award for her contributions in astrobiology. But I don't want to take more time because we have an exciting talk. Vicky, please. Okay, thank you very much. That was an, uh, a, a very, a very yeah. lovely introduction and uh, perfect for, you'll see what my next slides are. So that was a, that was a great intro. So today uh, we're going to be talking about characterizing terrestrial exoplanets for habitability and life. And I'll steal Dave's Dave's uh, kickoff from lunch today that, you know, we live in a very interesting time because we're, we're on the precipice of being able to actually start to take measurements of terrestrial planets. And in fact, uh, members of the community have already tried doing that with various degrees of success, but we really are at that point where we're going to start trying to study uh, very small planets. But um, so today what I'm going to be talking about is work done by my research group, the Virtual Planetary Laboratory. Um, but I'm only going to be able to talk about like a tiny portion of it, part of what we call Task C, the habitable planet. Uh, but I think it's a very significant portion. It's the one where we try to understand plausible environments that might be out there um, and then figure out you know, how to discriminate those environments using spectra and other observations and ultimately tie them to future uh, upcoming missions and also two mission concepts. Um, so I'll be focusing on that today, but we do do a whole bunch of other interesting stuff that involves looking at our Earth and our solar system to use it as a laboratory to understand exoplanets, looking at our Earth through time, which is really just a, a series of different habitable worlds, alien ones for which we have uh, both geological and biological constraints. Um, and in the living planet, our biologists get to come out and go in the sun and, and uh, do field work and, and learn about uh, what, what uh, life forms are actually putting into the environment. But ultimately, it all gets tied back into this observer. So the observer task is where we take what we've simulated or learnt and put it through instrumentation uh, models and try and understand what we might actually see. So the VPL is a very large group, so what I'm presenting here is not, you know, my work per se. It's a very large group, including some people from Harvard, uh, Robin and Feng Ding. Um, and so uh, there's, there's quite a lot of us here. The color coding is more senior people versus uh, sort of people up to assistant professor type level, um, just to show you kind of the balance of, of what we have there. Um, and in particular, I want to give a big shout out to these two people. Um, so this is Jake Lustig Jaeger and Andrew Lankowski, who are my two senior graduate students at the moment. They will graduate in the next year, and the vast majority of what you see today um, is their work. Uh, so please hire them. Okay, so, all right. So we're going to be talking about terrestrial planets today. Um, and so, you know, on this diagram, that's these things over here. OK, so obviously they're extremely small and therefore extremely challenging to observe, but of course, extremely important. You're sitting on one right now, um, and it is the only example of a habitable planet we have uh, to learn from. So the terrestrial planets, um, I tend to characterize them as, you know, uh, rocky objects, rocky metallic objects that have relatively thin, probably high molecular weight atmospheres. And so that's what we're going to uh, call a terrestrial planet here. 
Um, but of course, as we look out into the universe, um, we have the four examples we have in our own solar system, but we anticipate that as we look at terrestrial planets around other stars, that those environments will likely be very diverse um, compared to what we're used to. Um, and part of that will be because of their planet formation and migration history, which may be very different to our solar system planets, um, their interior outgassing composition and history, their history of planetary and stellar interactions and how that affects their evolution, including atmospheric loss and photochemistry. So there is a huge multi-parameter interacting system that goes into making and changing a planet over time. And so uh, we have this amazing opportunity to go out and learn about what's happening with all of those processes. And the hope is, of course, that it will help put our own solar system in context and also just help us understand planetary processes in general. One thing I do want to point out, too, is that terrestrial exoplanets will likely support what we call secondary atmospheres. So the primordial hydrogen helium atmosphere has been ripped off, um, and we now have a secondary atmosphere that is produced primarily from outgassing or volatile delivery. And so in this case, we're really kind of connecting the interiors of planets to an observable exterior of the atmosphere. Um, so that's also an exciting thing about terrestrial planets, is we may get to understand the entire body um, by being able to observe the atmosphere. So my group is using models and what we know of planetary processes from objects in our own system uh, to try and understand the potential diversity of these worlds. Um, and as Dave, in his lunch talk, uh, gave this sort of great, uh, with extra, extra evidence, uh, this great argument for why they're, that exoplanets really could be a terrestrial class in and of themselves, uh, we saw sort of early uh, evidence that we were looking at sort of two classes of bodies um, and this sort of pioneering work by... Um, uh, Leslie Rogers here, uh, looking at sort of the probability of a planet being rocky versus being more, more gaseous. Uh, and she sort of put this together this cutoff at about 1.5, 1.6 times the radius of the Earth. Below that radius, you're more likely to be rocky. Above it, you're more likely to be gaseous. Um, then we have this uh, Fulton gap, uh, which has also been seen with, with uh, better calibrated mass measurements. I'm uh, sorry, size measurements. We're able to put these things into two separate bins and see that there really does seem to be a class of these sort of more dense things, the, the rocky terrestrials, um, as opposed to these sub-Neptune objects um, as well. And so I guess I'm arguing that I think the terrestrials are out there, um, and Dave showed some excellent uh, information at lunch as well, showing that with masses as well, we're starting to see this, this dichotomy um, in these smaller objects. So we really are at the dawn of terrestrial exoplanet characterization. We're learning about this new subclass, um, and this is uh, you know, work that's been done with uh, HST and Spitzer and K2 to try and get measurements of these objects. Um, again, you know, these are sort, they're sort of only the measurements an astronomer could love. They're sort of bordering on a straight line. And what we're trying to do right now is show the deviation. Uh, is there a deviation from a straight line? Um, and if there's a deviation from a straight line, then this thing is not terrestrial. So what we've been able to show with these measurements, even though they are straight lines, um, is that, that these uh, objects that we're looking at, these smaller planets, Trappist 1, B, and C in this case, uh, because uh, we do not see this, this uh, sort of massive water absorption from an extended hydrogen atmosphere, um, then these planets are likely to be high molecular weight atmospheres. And there's been other theoretical work done um, by Moran et al., which I probably haven't put on the slide, um, also showing that that is probably not due to aerosols hanging in the atmosphere, that this really is uh, an indication that we have a planet with a high molecular weight atmosphere, like a terrestrial. Um, over here, we have some more data points um, on other objects, uh, TRAPPIST-1b, uh, and I'm just showing here some of our simulated models of terrestrial planets for that object. And even though these data points are completely indistinguishable again from a straight line, I'm just saying that it's, it's interesting that terrestrial planet spectra at least fit this potential straight line. So we're looking forward, of course, to having the error bars collapse down a bit so we can really um, point out things that we might be able to observe. And this thing here, the, the largest feature in the spectrum is the 4.2 micron CO2 band, definitely a sing signature of a terrestrial type atmosphere. So we also know in this sort of uh, exoplanet terrestrial diversity that formation and migration may also form volatile rich um, terrestrials. And so the, the, the hints we have at that are again this TRAPPIST-1 system. So seven planets transiting around an M8 dwarf, uh, a star that's not much bigger uh, than Jupiter. Um, and from uh, observing these objects and looking at transit timing variation and their transit sizes, uh, we're able to sort of plot where they are on one of these planet mass radius diagrams. And they show densities that can be comparable to those of Earth and Venus, but also potentially a little bit uh, less dense, although the errors are still quite large on this. Um, the fact that the TRAPPIST-1 planets are in the resonant chain that we find them in also indicates that they probably migrated inwards and fell into that resonant chain as they came in. 
um, speaking to a more distant birth environment where they may have picked up more volatiles. So we're looking at um, objects that may be in some ways terrestrial, but perhaps have a far larger volatile abundance than we do um, for the relatively dry terrestrials we have in our planetary system. So that's migration and evolution may, may generate diversity. And then also um, our terrestrials, all of us, undergo stellar geological and atmospheric evolution. Um, and so you end up with sort of very different paths and outcomes for planets, depending on where they are relative to their star and how they were formed um, and what happens as the star goes through its evolutionary sequence. So um, when I show this in public talks, I like to say if you imagine Earth you know, as a kernel of corn, then Venus is definitely the popcorn of the solar system. Okay, this is a planet that has <coughs> greatly diverged, uh, you know, from probably the initial composition that it had and now has this massive carbon dioxide atmosphere uh, and has lost uh, the science that it has, in fact, also lost an ocean. So uh, we hope uh, when we go out into uh, the exoplanet uh, community, when we go out into the exoplanet population, uh, that we will in fact see exovenuses as well, objects that we can look at that probably went through similar uh, sequence to our, our Venus, um, although maybe coming at it via different ways through a different form of evolution. And the star is arguably one of the biggest effects on the potential uh, habitability of a planet. So the habitability being whether or not it's able to acquire and maintain liquid water on its surface. Um, and so if we look at the um, early evolution of stars, uh, we notice this phenomenon where the, the lower mass stars, the M dwarfs, tend to start off extremely bright, uh, superluminous pre-main sequence phase as they collapse down to their final main sequence size. Um, and what that means is for like a planet like TRAPPIST-1 um, at its or current orbital position, uh, basically uh, as time goes on it evolves across this uh, line here. But what that means is that it spends a significant fraction of its time in the popcorn zone um, getting radiation that is significantly higher than that experienced by Venus. And so what may happen with these planets is any planet that forms in what is currently the habitable zone for that star may have undergone uh, significant uh, uh, forcing by radiation for up to a billion years for some of these smaller stars um, prior to entering the habit uh, habitable zone. And so we expect that that kind of experience can severely modify um, a planet's atmosphere. And so to sh kind of show you then the difference between the G dwarfs and the M dwarfs, there's this fantastic movie that, that went up on Twitter recently by Laura Schaefer, who I believe you know. Um, so this is her movie. Uh, it's actually her husband, who's a graphic designer, put this together. Um, and so what you can see is that for the Earth, that blue line is the habitable zone for our G dwarf star, but the Earth has essentially been in the habitable zone right from the get-go, whereas you can see that Proxima Centauri was very interior to the habitable zone, meaning it was much closer to the star um, early on. And you can see that the, the, as the star fades, the habitable zone moves in to sweep over it. So when you look at that M dwarf planet that's sitting beautifully in the habitable zone, just remember that it probably had a very nasty um, beginning uh, to its life. All right, so if you subject a planet to that level of radiation and you put it in a runaway and you start to lose water from it, what you will also do is potentially build up oxygen in the atmosphere. And so these plots are from uh, Luger and Bonds, Rodrigo Luger's um, thesis work. Um, and he pointed out that ocean loss may in fact generate a potentially massive oxygen <laughs> atmosphere. So if you lose an ocean of water, you can generate about 250 bars of oxygen in a planetary atmosphere. Now, not all of that will hang around. Um, some of it can be lost by dissolving into a magma ocean. It can oxidize the planetary crust. It can escape to space. But some fraction of it will likely remain. Um, and so uh, we may end up with uh, oxygen that has been generated not by a photosynthetic biosphere, but by uh, ocean loss on this particular planet. And so um, I have some simulations here as well for TRAPPIST-1, just looking at what uh, TRAPPIST-1 may have lost. And I apologize, Emmeline is here. I did not, normally I'd cite you in here. I just want to say that. So, um, so Emmeline Beaumont has also looked at these problems. Um, and so, uh, so what we're looking at here is looking at the amount of oceans, the total number of oceans that we could potentially lose for these planets, the TRAPPIST-1 planets early on, um, and then how much oxygen would build up as a result. And it turns out that all of these planets would lose some fraction of an ocean, although the furthest out one may lose um, less than a, an ocean's worth of, an Earth ocean's worth of water. So these are things we have to worry about because they may generate oxygen-rich environments. The other thing we have to worry about when looking at the diversity of what we might see out there um, is the process of atmospheric <coughs> loss. Um, this may entirely strip an atmosphere. And so that, of course, is catastrophic for habitability if we don't have the atmosphere. It may change the composition of the atmosphere by stripping away more volatile lower mass elements. 
Um, but the point to remember is the planet is an entire system. It's not just losing stuff off the top. There's stuff coming in from the bottom as well. And that sometimes gets lost in some of these atmospheric escape papers where they say, oh, hey, well, you know, uh, this one bar Earth-like atmosphere could be lost in 365 million years. But I'll give a shout out to um, Katie Garcia Sage, who also then went and looked and said, but actually that is at less than the current calculated loss rate um, of H2 plus and O2 plus from the Earth's, uh, car that, that, sorry, that loss rate is less than the current replenishment rate of those two things. So, so again, we do have to consider, sure, they're losing their atmosphere, but can these volatile rich planets, for example, take that in their stride and be able to uh, maintain an atmosphere over time? So these are questions which we hope, again, to be able to observationally test by going out and seeing whether these planets are, in fact, able to maintain an atmosphere. So I talked about O2, atmospheric escape. Another thing that may just be out there is, is the exo-Venus idea. Um, that being that um, after uh, water loss, you may go through an enriched O2 uh, time period for the atmosphere. But then again, um, as O2 is lost um, and as uh, basically plate tectonics, is, plate tectonics is shut down because we don't have the, the water um, uh, uh, working on the on the crustal plates to change the uh, the buoyancy of them, um, and so what might eventually happen is that you will still be outgassing uh, CO2 into the atmosphere, and that may build up over time. And so that's one way um, in which uh, the Venus atmosphere became CO2 rich. The other thing was that as the runaway greenhouse uh, went on and the surface became uh, much uh, uh, hotter, uh, basically any any um, CO2 trapped in carbonates would also be potentially volatilized. So you can imagine, you know, this, this uh, trapped carbon dioxide in the ocean and the crust actually being boiled out and put up into the atmosphere. So it's potential we might see those types of atmospheres out there as well. So we're excited to go look at these things like the hot Earths, GJ1132b, Trappist-1s, B, C, and maybe D. Um, they may have undergone similar processes, um, and they will be excellent initial tests for whether or not we have an oxygen-dominated atmosphere left behind, um, or a carbon dioxide-dominated atmosphere, or something that surprises us. So that's kind of a rundown on, on the, the diversity uh, we might expect to see out there. Um, I haven't talked about habitable planets yet, but I will do that in a sec. Um, so. One thing I do want to get across, too, is that evolution could actually generate uninhabitable planets in the habitable zone. And I know it will come no, as no surprise to most of you that the habitable zone is not a benediction. It does not guarantee that you will be habitable. Um, you have to meet a bunch of other criteria, and they're, they're, they're quite uh, uh, many and stringent. Um, but we just want to point out, so this is um, work that was done by Andrew Lukowski, uh, looking at coupled climate photochemical models of these different types of ocean loss atmospheres, um, and also an aqua planet, which was not inhabited, but it's an Earth-like world that we did for TRAPPIST-1E. Uh, um, and these are the calculated surface temperatures of that atmosphere in Kelvin. And so uh, you will realize that the surface temperatures seem to range, um, you know, a great span depending on whether or not the thing actually turned into a Venus and sits at TRAPPIST-1B's position, uh, or whether we have a more O2-rich atmosphere uh, with less CO2 that is therefore quite cold. Um, but the point is here in the habitable zone, depending on the atmospheric composition, which depends on the history of the planet and what it, it ended up with, whether it got a factory pre-installed, you know, oxygen atmosphere or carbon dioxide atmosphere, um, will actually change the surface temperature and therefore the habitability of the object. So instead of this kind of scenario, we may end up with something that looks more like this. Um, so there could be Venuses all the way through, um, simply because they've all gone through runaway and have not managed to recover from that. Um, there are processes that might allow them to recover, and so that's an interesting area that my group's looking at right now, is whether or not we can actually regain habitability after we've lost it. Um, but the reason this planet here is a, is a naked Venus, you can see the Magellan images um, of the uh, surface of the planet, is that in fact, uh, TRAPPIST-1b is so hot that Andrew found that you couldn't condense sulfuric acid water clouds, um, sulfuric acid uh, water combo clouds in its atmosphere, and so it may actually be a clear, a clear sky Venus, which would be interesting to, to go after. Again, I said the requirements for habitability were many and stringent. Um, so again, part of our sort of assessment of what's going on here is trying to understand how all of these different elements, the interaction with the star, the planetary properties, its initial evolution, and how the planetary system, through migration or interaction with other planets, actually helps us understand habitability.
So I flashed this up at lunch, uh, but this really is sort of the field of uh, terrestrial planets, habitability, and astrobiology at the moment. It's really trying to understand all of these characteristics and interactions between these different elements and what that means uh, for exoplanet habitability. So I'm just going to make an aside also about transmission direct imaging and astrobiology, just to, as we before we go into sort of looking at um, the, the types of things that we might observe. Um, I just want to point out some, some uh, things that are important about these two sort of different ways of observing things. So in direct imaging, um, so this is, you know, one of these days we hope to have a large telescope um, that will allow us to actually image the planets in a planetary system and to be, take individual spectra um, of the different planets. Because we're nadir looking, um, you know, we're looking down straight through the atmosphere of the planet, um, we are, in fact, uh, less susceptible to hazes and clouds because of the shorter path length, and it allows us to potentially probe all the way down to the surface of the planet. That tells us stuff about the actual surface. Is it an ocean? Is it made of rock? Is it? And it also tells us about the near surface environment. So the near surface environment is where the biosphere hangs out. It's where it spends most of its time. And so being able to get down into that deep lower um, atmosphere uh, is important for trying to characterize planets for habitability and life. So we get the improved habitability assessment of the surface environment um, and improved access to these near surface biosignatures. Some biosignatures are evenly mixed. Oxygen is one of them. It goes all the way up and down through the atmosphere. It's so abundant. Other biosignatures may be found closer to the surface. Um, for transmission, we're going to get that first. JWST, ground-based telescopes, we're going to be able to use that technique first. Um, however, transmission um, skims through the lower tropopause and upper uh, sorry, the upper tropopause and uh, stratosphere of a planet. Um, it's unlikely to probe the near-surface environment just because of geometric effects. Um, it gives us no information on the planetary surface. We have to infer the presence of an ocean or what the surface is like from what's in the atmosphere. Um, but it is sensitive to higher altitude trace gases. It can sometimes pick up things that are too weak to actually make a significant absorption in the nadir looking beam. So it does have that um, advantage. But if we're going to use transmission to look for life, we need to focus on biosignatures that might survive at higher altitudes that are not photochemically destroyed when you, when you get up there. OK, so now I'm going to show you some plots of, of things that we might see, um, so features that we might see with, with, uh, for these types of planets with uh, future telescopes. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the actual detectability. Will we be able to see these? So here, again, this is something only a spectroscopist would love. I love this. This is awesome. So, so this is a series of spectra um, of these different types of planets. So, so an O2, so a post-ocean loss, oxygen-dominated planet that's been completely desiccated. Nothing's coming out of its interior. It has no water vapor left. We have an oxygen outgassing atmosphere. So it lost an ocean, uh, but it's still outgassing from its interior. It still has volatiles in there. It's still bringing them up um, into the system. So we expect to see more water in that particular case. And a Venus-like clear 10-bar um, uh, atmosphere. The reason we have these, these 10 bar atmospheres is, again, these are post-ocean loss. These are post having the ocean actually end up in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And so what you see in these spectra, I mean, if you're reading all the labels, is there are a lot of features throughout this wavelength range. So this is the wavelength range accessible to um, JWST. And so the things that have probably caught your eyes first off if you're used to looking at spectra are these really prominent absorption bands from carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide um, is uh, very, a very strong absorber. Um, and uh, it is interesting in that it is such a strong absorber that, in fact, the strength of these bands, the difference in carbon dioxide abundance in these mo uh, models um, ranges from 0.5 to 96%. So 0.5% to 96%. Um, and yet, the strength of the bands is pretty much comparable. So CO2 is an excellent indicator of a terrestrial planet atmosphere, but it's not a very good discriminant of the type of atmosphere that you have. Still, let's go for it. I'm, I'm, I'm betting that one of the first uh, things that we will see um, in these terrestrial atmospheres, if we see a terrestrial atmosphere, is this carbon dioxide band. Um, for hot planets, the water vapor um, is still quite strong, especially for the outgassing atmospheres, and that's because it's able to get up higher in the atmosphere where we're able to see it with transmission. Um, so again, water is not necessarily a great indicator of a habitable planet because we will also see it um, in these warmer planets that still have volatiles in their atmosphere. And the signs of the ocean um, can be seen in these uh, very strong, I'll just go back here so you can just see them. In, uh, you can see the, oh, where are they? 
Okay, so it's the blue, it's these sort of triangle-shaped things here are um, due to collision of oxygen with each other. So O2, O2, collisionally induced absorption. You generally only see that in a transmission spectrum when you get O2 above about three bars of pressure. Um, and so what we're looking at there is really the, the remnant of a, of a lost ocean in that particular case. So this is much more oxygen than we would expect from a biosphere. Um, and so that collisionally induced absorption may be an indicator that we're seeing um, the remnant of an ocean. More of these spectra, this is TRAPPIST-1e this time, the potentially habitable planet. So we've added on some aqua, clear and cloudy type things. Again, carbon dioxide dominates. Uh, we do see more water vapor features at the smaller, at, at the uh, lower wavelengths. Um, but uh, the actual oxygen is difficult to pull out. Um, and so that's going to be very challenging. But we're also starting to see trace gases from things like uh, methane, SO2 and ozone, which may help discriminate some of these environments, but I'm later going to show you they're going to be incredibly challenging for JWST. But nonetheless, they are there um, in this particular planetary atmosphere, and so maybe that's something we want to try and push ourselves to try and observe down the line. Um, if we look in emission, um, we can also see that these different environments produce very different emission spectra. So if anybody approximates their planet as a black body, I want to talk to you. Do not do that, okay? Um, these things are very diverse. Uh, and so uh, you can see strong absorption from SO2 and CO2 here through the Venus clear atmosphere. There's no water vapor in this atmosphere, so we end up with this fantastic window around about six microns. So again, uh, I expect these atmospheres to be diverse. This is awesome. If we take an observation, we have a chance of potentially discriminating between these different types of environments. So let's talk a little about targets. So what are our targets going to look like? So I think for the James Webb Space Telescope, our best targets are probably going to come from the ground-based surveys because they can find planets that are orbiting fairly late type, very small M dwarf stars. Um, and that will give us the best signal uh, overall. And so there's a bunch of fantastic targets already out there. Um, so we have the transiting exo-Venus class things like GJ1132b. Um, we have habitable zone terrestrial planets, Proxima, LHS 1140, Ross 128. And then we've got transiting exo-Venus and habitable zone terrestrials and frozen planets all in one system in this amazing TRAPPIST-1 um, system. And so TESS will find approximately 10 more habitable zone um, terrestrial planets, but those will be around larger stars, and that may be a problem um, for JWST. Um, and the reason for that is just simply a geometric one um, in that uh, in this particular case, I've simulated an Earth-like planet, or more accurately, Andrew has, simulated an Earth-like planet um, and just uh, with the same surface fluxes, so the same amount of stuff coming off the surface of the atmosphere to, gen to surface of the of planet to generate the atmosphere. Um, and then uh, we've, we've looked at the transmission spectra for this planet orbiting different types of stars. And simply the size of the star relative to the planet um, can very much knock down the signals coming from the atmosphere, as well as photochemical effects that actually change the lifetime and abundance of methane in the atmosphere, depending on the stellar spectrum. And so what we're seeing is on these earlier type stars, so this is 80 LEO, um, that we're really only generating signals from the atmosphere that are about five parts per million, as opposed to maybe up to 40 or 50 parts per million for some of these other um, uh, stars. So, again, large stars are going to be very difficult for us to observe simply because we don't get that contrast. Um, and for the TESS predicted yields, this, uh, this is from Barclay et al., um, they have this square here for an optimistic habitable zone and for planets that are sort of more on the puffy side, more on the sort of 1.25 up to 2.3 or thereabouts, which admittedly will have larger scale heights, so we'll get better signals through them, but they're not really high molecular weight terrestrial atmospheres in that particular case. If we use the conservative habitable zone and that cutoff of about 1.5 uh, for the radius, for things that might be truly terrestrial through here, at least the test prediction, predicted yields are not overlapping in there. But who knows? Maybe, maybe they'll find something um, in that box. Uh, but at least the, the current predictions may not make it. But I had a great talk with Jim Attar today about how maybe the population they're drawing from doesn't accurately represent that. So we'll hold out hope that they do, in fact, find something um, in there for us to observe. The large aperture space-based telescopes, the concepts that we're currently considering for exoplanet surveys, um, will basically find their own targets. They will be able to observe anything we've discovered up until that time, but they are sufficiently next generation capable that they will go out and find their own targets. Um, 
And for something as ambitious, for example, as Louvoir A, we'll be surveying hundreds of stars, not, not the handful of stars we're talking about for JWST and ground-based, but hundreds and hundreds of stars um, to ultimately try and get a sample of about 50 exo-Earths, so rocky planets within the habitable zone. Um, so we can do that within about two years based on our design reference mission. We'll be able to get at the same time preliminary characterization with colors, orbits, and partial spectra for those um, systems that we assess. Uh, and we'll be able to do it for planets um, orbiting all sorts of different types of stars, from A all the way down to M. So we'll be able to, again, look at that diversity as a function of the stellar parent. Um, and essentially, uh, again, I would like to have a large sample because I want to see this diversity. And this is really a function, unfortunately, of telescope diameter. Uh, we all know that, right? Uh, and so uh, basically, as we go up uh, in diameter, uh, essentially, the yield rate goes up as diameter squared. So. So that's something that we, we do have to consider. So we hope um, with these more ambitious missions that if we can get to sort of a 51 candidate uh, terrestrial exoplanet candidate survey where we can then go ahead and look at those planets, determine whether or not they are habitable or have life on them, we can essentially um, you know, constrain the frequency of planets that are do have that water vapor inhabitability to be um, at least 6% or less with 95% confidence with a 51 with a 51 object sample. And of course, the more candidates we have, that increases the chance of observing an exo-Earth. OK, I'll just talk briefly also about biosignatures. So um, for those of you who are at the lunch talk, you know, biosignature is life's global impact on the environment. Um, and I have to admit, we sound a little crazy trying to observe life at a distance of 10 parsecs. But the way we're going to try and do it is by understanding how life modifies the actual global environment of a planet. How does it change the global characteristics of a planet? Um, and so a planetary biosignature, you can think of it as just a way that life has modified the environment in such a large scale that it is, in fact, potentially detectable. So um, our criteria for identifying biosignatures, uh, we sort of have this, this three-pronged little uh, rhyme that we use, reliability, survivability, detectability. Uh, what we're looking for in a really good biosignature is something that um, is definitely produced by life and is less likely to be produced by um, another type of uh, planetary process, such as geology or photochemistry. It must survive in the atmosphere to be able to build up to a sufficient uh, abundance that we can detect it. So we don't want things that are at the one part per billion level in the atmosphere. We want things that are a significant fraction of the atmosphere. Um, and so in that case, the molecule has to be able to avoid uh, sort of you know, bonding with the surface or being destroyed uh, by lightning or uh, by photochemistry. So it really needs to survive in the atmosphere and also not get lost to space, sorry. Um, and then detectability, because we're all astronomers here, uh, you know, we care about does it build up to detectable levels? Is it detectable using likely observing modes? Is it active in the observed wavelength region? And is it clear of overlap with other common planetary species? So we're looking also at, you know, sure, it's there, it built up, but can we actually see it? So the classic biosignatures you're probably all aware of um, are the, sort of this idea of atmospheric disequilibrium. There are others, but I won't talk about them today. Um, but the, uh, the disequilibrium idea, uh, I just want to point out that, yes, oxygen and methane are not in equilibrium um, in our environment, in our atmosphere. Um, there's also been recent work um, by Josh Christensen Totten, it's another grad student at UW, looking at whether, in fact, the atmosphere, the N2 and the O2 and the ocean are in equilibrium, and in fact, they are not. So if we can tell that a planet has an ocean, and we can detect N2 and O2, and there's a big if on that because N2 is like a stealth molecule. Um, it's probably most detectable when it crashes into another N2, uh, but it's challenging. But nonetheless, this combination plus the ocean is also potentially a sign that life is kind of processing what is happening with nitrogen. So I do want to make this point, though, that the disequilibrium is not really the biosignature itself. The disequilibrium is interesting, and it tells us we should look deeper. Um, but as the point was made um, in the astrobiology uh, uh, report and other places, you know, lots of things can produce a disequilibrium in a planetary atmosphere. But if we can trace the disequilibrium down to the surface fluxes that produce it, the magnitude um, and potential sources of those surface fluxes can help us narrow down whether or not um, that particular disequilibrium is due to life. So this may seem very Earth-centric, but I think some of the first biosignatures we will search for will be those of photosynthesis. And the arguments I make for that um, are that you know, photosynthesis is the killer app. This is the metabolism that learned how to use the sun, the dominant energy source on the surface of our planet, um, to do its job for it, to essentially create um, uh, uh, redox pairs where there, where there were none by splitting water. 
um, that particular uh, uh, metabolism has taken over the planet um, and it has severely modified our atmosphere um, on geological timescales. Now, as I discussed at lunch, it hasn't been dominating our atmosphere for the entire time, and so there's a chance of potentially missing it. But nonetheless, if we can understand photosynthesis and what it does, that is probably one of the biggest impacts, um, certainly in the Earth's environment, is the abundant oxygen, the surface reflectivity on our planet, and also uh, periodic uh, annual changes in gases in the atmosphere. So there's a bunch of different markers of photosynthesis in our atmosphere. So we'll look for oxygen first. Um, and the other advantages of oxygen is it's evenly mixed with the atmosphere, so I can see it even in transmission, potentially. And it absorbs in the visible to near infrared, which is where our telescopes uh, tend to work. So it has some, um, some advantages. That being said, we won't just confine ourselves to only oxygen, but I can tell you that we will not build a mission that cannot do oxygen. <laughs> okay? So, um, so we're trying to put together at the moment this comprehensive framework for biosignature assessment. Um, and so these are the key questions that we're trying to ask ourselves, you know, what does life produce and how does it impact this environment? Can I come up with sort of interesting and novel biosignatures that I could look for? Let's try and break out of this paradigm of just using O2. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a bunch of work being done on that, just looking at, you know, volatile molecules or looking back through the earth through time, trying to understand the metabolisms that were dominant and what they might have produced. Um, and also doing modeling where we look at, okay, if I have this flux off the biosphere, what survives, what is, what is detectable? We ask, how can a dead planet fool us? You know, are there any ways that we can generate the things we're looking for that we think are from life, but instead are produced by photochemistry or geological processes? So how do we uh, guard against false positives? How do we interpret what will no doubt be absolutely crappy data at the very limits of detectability, okay? How are we going to be able to interpret this best of all? Um, do we rely only on the data? Do we rely on models and understanding of processes? Um, do we try and, you know, sort of squeeze the very last piece of information out of this very hard won data? And then finally, and this was asked by Avi at lunch, you know, how do we quantify our uncertainties? How are we actually going to become confident that what we have here is life and not a planetary process? I don't have answers for any of these questions. Um, these are what's driving the field right now. These are the things we're trying to understand um, best. Actually, that's not true. I kind of have a partial answer to number two, uh, which is, you know, can, can a dead planet fool us? Um, and this is sort of ongoing work, um, although we've made really significant headway into it. A bunch of different uh, research groups working together um, have essentially, and, and a lot of this is VPL stuff, in fact, I think almost all of these teams are VPL affiliated in some way, um, have looked at how we might actually generate uh, oxygen. I'll cut right to the chase. You can generate it by losing an ocean and building up oxygen, as I mentioned. And you can generate it by having uh, a spectrum from a star that drives the, the breakup of carbon dioxide and water vapor in different ways and allows oxygen to then build up in the atmosphere. And so that photochemistry is not possible on our, G, our Earth orbiting a G dwarf, but it turns out it's probably highly likely on planets orbiting M dwarfs. And so by pushing out into this phase space and trying to learn, we've shocked ourselves, but we've also thankfully, come up with things like, oh, well, you know, if it's, it's stable CO2 breakup, um, then we would expect to see CO as well as the O2 in the atmosphere. So here's a, something we could look for. So we're trying to find out what the discriminants are that let us know that a planetary process is working rather than, than a life process. And so I hope that uh, that actually helps us make our detections more robust by allowing us to go down a checklist of successively um, more interesting observations to try and rule out all of these other different types of mechanisms. Okay, so let's cut to the chase. Searching for habitability in life. How do we actually do this? Okay, so I think there's four fundamental questions that really drive what we're looking for here. The first one is, does it have an atmosphere? If it doesn't, if the planet does not have an atmosphere, we're kind of toast. Sure, there could be, you know, chemosynthetic life in the subsurface. That tends to be very parsimonious. It doesn't li like to get things out into the, into the upper levels. Um, so maybe it's very difficult to detect. And also we're astronomers, so, you know, we, we would like to be able to detect things remotely. It's much better if, in fact, there is an atmosphere to mix our biosphere up into and um, be able to observe it. So does it have an atmosphere? Without that, it's difficult to be habitable. It's difficult to detect what's going on. What is the nature of that atmosphere? What is that atmosphere made of? Um, is it full of interesting gases? Can I infer habitability from it? Uh, you know, what, what is going on with that atmosphere? Does it have an ocean? Does this planet have an ocean? Um, and there are ways I can try and infer an ocean, and with direct imaging, I can potentially directly detect the ocean. Um, are there signs of life? And that's ultimately, you know, once we have worked our way down this checklist, maybe we get to see things um, that are potentially uh, due to biology. So in the does it have an atmosphere department, um, 
we have been doing some work, as has Carolyn Morley and Laura Kreidberg here, um, looking at sort of how many uh, transits would we need of the TRAPPIST-1 planets um, to be able to rule out a straight line. Remember the great thing about looking at the TRAPPIST-1 planets with HST was that they were a straight line, which meant they weren't showing us these, you know, high, large scale height features. In this case, we're actually trying to figure out whether it's not a straight line um, by looking at uh, whether or not this, we can see essentially deviations from a straight line due to absorption lines. We're being agnostic about which absorption lines they are. We're simply just saying, you know, is this data set consistent with a straight line, yes or no, and to what um, level of significance? And so what we have shown is that, you know, if you run these simulations through Pandexo um, and simulate for JWST, is that we think for um, uh, most of our atmospheres, remember CO2 is strong in all of them, so it's kind of the universal, not a straight line indicator. Um, in that case, in as little as, as two transits, we could potentially detect whether or not TRAPPIST-1b um, or, and, and the other planets, in fact, have, have an atmosphere. So I think it's in about less than about 10 overall. We can tell whether they have an atmosphere. A NERSPEC prism sub-512 and group 6, if you're nerdy about that, um, is really the most sensitive um, observing mode for this uh, type of comparison. And so we're getting sort of 2 to 10 for this, which compares really um, favorably with Carolyn and Laura's work on about six transits uh, for similar types of planets. So I think telling whether or not the TRAPPIST-1 planets have an atmosphere is probably within our grasp. We can probably do that. So what is the nature of this atmosphere? And then it gets a lot more complicated. So... Um, for uh, JWST and TRAPPIST-1, uh, carbon dioxide, water vapor, ozone, and that O2, O2 collisionally induced absorption um, may be detectable in the atmosphere in relatively few transits. We might be able to get away with that for TRAPPIST-1b, which is the easiest, the closest one and the easiest target to detect. It is not habitable. Um, so to assess the planet's evolutionary state, we might go through the following sort of thought process or series of observations where we detect the planetary atmosphere via carbon dioxide absorption. We detect or rule out the post-runaway oxygen-dominated thing by looking for O2O2 CIA and hopefully not seeing it, um, or via ozone absorption. Um, and we might take more than 12 transits to do that, but that's not too terrible. Um, and I also want to point out that that is actually an observational test of the habitable zone. We're getting to the point now where with TRAPPIST-1, as I said, as an astrobiologist, I couldn't have designed a better system. It's brilliant. It's got, you know, a few planets interior to the habitable zone, closer to the star, some actually within the habitable zone, and then maybe at least one outside the habitable zone. And so we'll be able to uh, hopefully have a look at whether these things have maintained atmospheres and try and get at some of the molecules in the atmosphere to tell whether we can see if they're all that, you know, Venus is all the way through, or whether we're actually seeing atmospheres that have not um, undergone and complete ocean loss. Um, and then finally, um, if we can observe some of these more exotic things like sulfur dioxide um, in the atmosphere, which we think might take more than 125 transits, that's a lot. I mean, we would have to love this target to go after that much time. Um, and it would take, of course, a long time stretched out over the, the course of the mission, but maybe it's worthwhile. Um, gases like sulfur dioxide are very soluble. They could be, uh, you know, absorbed into an ocean. And so if you see them in the atmosphere, it's it's a fairly good indicator that you're probably not looking at a lot of surface water um, on, the, on the planet. Um, I just also, since I'm, I'm here for Louvoir, since I'm on the science and technology definition team, I'd also like to say that Louvoir can also do transmission spectroscopy. For some reason, there's been some misunderstanding about that. But where, uh, you know, it will be a massive telescope with a camera strapped to it and a spectrometer, so not a problem. Um, so we can, in fact, do transmission spectroscopy with um, Louvoir and be able to get, you know, pretty amazing observations that are in the comparable to JWST in the, in the short wavelength uh, range. That's the wavelength range, but, of course, at much heightened um, sensitivity in shorter periods of time. Uh, so just to show, say, Louvoir in direct imaging and then looking down into the atmosphere, um, it will take us of the order of hours, um, really, to get hours to days to get really excellent spectra of terrestrial planets with that mission. Okay, so that's the nature of the atmosphere. Does it have an ocean? So there's a bunch of different ways we can go after that. Some of them inferential and a little bit more direct. So can we detect surface temperatures and pressure? That is going to be challenging, and I'll tell you why. Because any planet where there's convection, what goes up must come down. We'll probably have 50% cloud cover, as we do on the Earth. And so when we measure a globally average temperature and pressure, that's going to be very challenging um, to actually uh, figure out whether that's from the surface or the atmosphere. Or it's, it's going to be compromised in that way. Still, it might get us close, right? Can we constrain the climate models with atmospheric composition? We'd have to measure greenhouse gases and try and calculate that. 
does it lack water-soluble gases in its atmosphere? If I see a whole bunch of water-soluble gases, um, then maybe I'm thinking, mm, maybe that makes it less likely that there's actually a surface ocean. And then finally, can we actually detect surface liquid water um, directly? And so I'll take you through some of these, how we might be able to do it. So with JWST and TRAPPIST-1, um, we can probably pick out the O2, O2 if it is there. And in fact, that the punchline of this is that JWST is probably good at detecting signs that an ocean has been lost. It's much better at that than being able to definitively say that an ocean is there. Okay, so JWST may show us ocean loss, but it's not going to be really great at telling us that an ocean is there. So we may see the O2O2 from a very massive oxygen-dominated atmosphere, which could be a post-ocean loss atmosphere. Um, and then over here, and this is a new paper that Andrew, um, so Jake has, Jake's just submitted this one. Andrew's working on this one. Um, but it turns out that HDO, again, because we have that slant path through the atmosphere, um, looking at um, HDO, so deuterated water vapor, uh, may in fact be accessible in as few as 10 transits, depending on um, you know, the ultimate sensitivity and noise floor for, for JWST. So that's also something we can go after. Of course, knowing that Venus lost an atmosphere is because of that measurement, being able to determine the D to H ratio in the Venus atmosphere. Um, so we can measure both HDO and water in the Venus atmosphere, and we'd be able to infer ocean loss from that. So we might be able to do something like that for, say, TRAPPIST-1b. Additional trace gases may be accessible, um, and this is another plot from Jake's uh, recent paper, which is in review at the moment. Um, in this case, we, he did a really exhaustive study of, of the different types of, of post-ocean loss atmospheres here and the different molecules we might be able to detect. The numbers are how many transits are needed for detection, and the little sub, uh, superscript is the, the instrument that would be best used for that. Um, so look out for that paper if you're interested in figuring out where um, these things might uh, be observable. But for many of these more trace gases, I mean, they really are quite challenging. You're looking at sort of often 40, 50 or so on um, numbers of, of transits to do this, but we didn't plot anything on here that took more than 100. Um, but, you know, it's going to be hard. Okay. Does it have an ocean? Um, so here's what I call solar system direct imaging. So these are observations of various objects in our solar system. Um, this is Kraken Mare reflecting, uh, uh, specularly reflecting this, this glint phenomenon off of a lake of ethane near the, the pole. Um, and then over here we have the Earth as seen by the Elcross spacecraft as it looped around several times before crashing into the moon, which was the, its ultimate mission. Um, but it was able to take the Earth at a bunch of different phases. And if you can see this very bright dot here in the crescent Earth, um, then congratulations, you're a remote ocean detector, because that is, um, in fact, the glint coming off the Earth's ocean. And so that glint um, changes the behavior of the Earth as a function of phase. Um, and so an, another piece of work that, that Jake has uh, done, which is already published, uh, is looking at actually mapping a planet. So if we had a direct imaging telescope and we were able to look at a planet and watch it as it rotated underneath us, as we were integrating to get spectra, for example, we, we can do this simultaneously with spectra. We, if we just have a long exposure on an object as it turns underneath us, we can bin uh, those observations and essentially map the planet. And what he showed was, but only longitudinally, what he showed was that we can, if we can discriminate two different surfaces, we can then look at these surfaces at different phases um, and see how they behave. So for this orange surface, which is actually land, we can map at closer to crescent and further from crescent, and we can say, yes, this map corresponds to this map, and this albedo of this, this surface did not change in that time. But I map ocean um, at the two different phases, and I see the ocean uh, albedo increase dramatically from phase to phase. And that is picking up the glint. And because we've mapped, we're far more sensitive because we're honing in on that particular surface, which is the one that's increasing the brightness. So that could potentially be a relatively inefficient way of looking at oceans. Um, and I made him do a yield estimate for this, <laughs> which I think was, was uh, important. Uh, but so basically, depending on the diameter of your mirror from 6 to 15 microns, um, your yield could be 1 to 10 detectable oceans um, for a direct imaging mission being able to go after it with this type of phenomenon. Okay, so finishing up here, are there signs of life? So um, detecting biosignatures with JWST, um, I am leading this paper at the moment for various reasons, um, but I wanted to uh, 
your, your colleague, Dave Charbonneau, uh, was very famous um, in the, uh, at the NAS uh, discussions we were having by saying, oh, JWST can't do biosignatures. And I said, yes, but do you know that? You know, I mean, we all feel that it can, but do we know that? So what we're doing is we're, we're actually running um, the simulations and showing the categorically, yes, it probably can't um, do a lot of biosignatures, except uh, for one special one. Um, but certainly the oxygen-dominated uh, photosynthetic biosphere that we're all talking about is going to be extremely challenging. So it's unlikely we will detect biogenic oxygen with JWST. I was hoping at 1.27 microns it might be stronger, but it wasn't. I know, I'm upset too. Um, so 0.76 microns is hopeless. Uh, 1.27 with Neurospec, we get a signal to noise of 1 in 30 transits, or 270 for signal to noise 3. I mean, if you were dedicated, maybe, but with systematics, probably not. Um, even more optimistic results from uh, the Heike Rauer's group um, actually show 172 transits. So that is more optimistic, but it's still a staggering number of um, integration uh, uh, transits. Um, ozone at 9.6. Uh, so we said, okay, what about the ozone? Uh, it's worse. Uh, <laughs> so signal to noise of 1 in 100 transits. Um, but, I mean, on the plus side, JWST is extremely sensitive to biogenic methane. Uh, and so the methane uh, is the yellow color through here. You can see very strong features from methane throughout the spectrum. So it gets that. Uh, and so one of the sort of biosignatures we could go after is, is this recent work again by Josh christensen uh who argues that if you see a CO2 methane couple, um, depending on the abundance of the methane, that could also be a potential um, biosignature uh, disequilibrium for, say, something like the Archean environment, the early Earth environment. And so we can definitely do methane and CO2, um, you know, if we, if we believe we have the performance we have. Um, but, you know, trying to do anything more exotic, like a sulfur biosphere with dimethyl sulfide or something, again, those larger molecules are more delicate. They get cleaved, um, and they tend to hug closer to the surface of the planet, so they're very difficult to see in transmission. So some of these more exotic molecules, including ethane, uh, which is fairly strong, and it absorbs out here, but you can see we just simply, even in 100 transits with Mary LRS, we just do not have the sensitivity to be able to, to do that. So I guess that's my, my downer is that, okay, we tried JWST. So I'm writing that up right now and I hope to submit it soon. But, but basically we're just saying probably highly unlikely. I guess I should skip along here and finish up soon. Uh, so I just wanted to point out, of course, there is ground-based observations um, possible as well. And you guys are way more expert in this than I am. So I'll, I'll probably just skip over this and maybe you can fill me in in the question session. Uh, but there are a bunch of different ways that we could get at um, looking at oxygen from the ground. And I think um, oxygen is, is a very interesting uh, prospect from the ground. So we, maybe we have JWST, methane in space, and oxygen from the ground, but we'd have to make sure our, our relative uh, um, targets actually overlapped. But I'm not sure they do overlap, but we can we'll look, at, look into that. But um, there's been sort of... Uh, uh, basically combinations of instruments proposed, sphere or uh, an espresso or cryos and, and a sphere uh, for the VLT uh, could maybe do this in the next five years or so. Um, I know that Mercedes Lopez Morales is working here on a bunch of different ways of, of using innovative uh, equipment to get at this. Um, she looked at sort of ELT high res, um, and I know she's working on GCLEF uh, stuff as well. Um, so, you know, we may in fact be able to, in the next five uh, years or so, and certainly when the ELTs come online, uh, be able to look for oxygen from the ground. And so I think that's um, really exciting uh, that we could be able to do that. And of course, I'm in downer mode right now. One of the things I, we have been looking at is the, the VPL models. By the way, we model all these things. And um, our model is, is really spectacular. It puts out this really high resolution spectra. And then we degrade them all to heck um, to basically do JWST or whatever. Um, so here we let our model smart run free at high resolution mode and actually show us uh, you know, what oxygen bands look like uh, for the Earth's atmosphere. So the blue is the Earth, and these are various different oxygen bands, so the A band, the B band, the gamma band, and the 1.27 micron. Um, and the, the yellow ones, though, are what happens if your planet is actually post-ocean loss and it is not a biosphere. And so what we're seeing here is very strong suppression of the continuum by that O2-O2 collisionally induced absorption in such a way that you probably wouldn't be able to even detect the O2. It will essentially suppress it out of the way, which might be a good thing because it would be a false positive anyway. Um, although, as a planetary scientist, I'm like, well, it would have been great to know that this thing had, was post-ocean loss, but maybe we can't actually see it. So we kind of plotted this up and said, well, you know, how many, how many lines will you actually have to do your template matching cross-correlation against? Um, and so for the, for the Earth, it's fine, but as soon as you add, you know, 10 bars of oxygen, you really suppress um, what you're able to get out of that band. And so that was just an interesting result that I have an undergraduate working on right now, and she's writing that up also. So we hope to get that in soon.
And then finally, detecting biosignatures with live wire. This is what it's made for. Um, and so we could definitely go after, uh, with this type of capability, definitely go after oxygen, methane, uh, and other aspects of that uh, type of classic Earth type thing. And then also looking at, and this is very interesting work that's been done uh, by a group of uh, people at UC Riverside. They do paleo uh, climates and paleo Earth. Um, they're looking at uh, before oxygen rose in our atmosphere, when there were photosynthesizers that were susceptible to uh, sort of seasonal cycles, um, looking at uh, whether or not we could actually see the atmosphere breathe in oxygen before oxygen became such a large fraction of the atmosphere. And it turns out we can see it in oxygen. It's kind of a flat line in the visible. But in ozone, um, down here in the UV, we could potentially see uh, sort of winter minimum and summer maximum of oxygen production um, for, say, a proterozoic-type planet. Um, and so this has kind of convinced us that we really should try and use the UV channel uh, for uh, even terrestrial planets with um, Louvoir. So this is sort of a more Archean-type atmosphere, but one where uh, because the oxygen is relatively low at this time, the ozone is not like, you know, flatlining it all the way down to the continuum, which is what we see for modern-day Earth. And so we're actually fairly sensitive to ozone and changes um, at the UV. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of sort of, you know, things we're thinking about, you know, what we might see, what we're hoping uh, might be feasible, um, dreams for the future. Uh, and so I'll just finish up there with sort of, um, sort of a summary of where I see us. So again, just remember, M dwarf planets undergo a very different M evolutionary path just due to what their star does. And I think that's fascinating. As a terrestrial planetary scientist, I want to know, do they retain their atmospheres? Are their atmospheres severely modified? You know, can they regain habitability over time? What do these things actually look like? Um, so in the near term, observations with JWST may help infer um, whether or not these terrestrial planets lost an ocean. Um, so again, JWST is better at detecting ocean loss than it is at detecting an ocean. Um, and in fact, because we're skimming through the upper atmosphere, we're not able to actually look at the surface at all. It may be feasible for JWST to do that methane CO2 biosignature. Um, oxygen, I think, is going to be incredibly challenging. Um, and so, again, that's probably not the way we're going to detect oxygen. Ground-based telescopes, though, probably the way we're going to detect oxygen. Um, and then finally, of course, in Dreams for the Future, um, these large aperture direct imaging space taste telescopes will give us sort of definitive characterization, really excellent spectra over a large enough sample size um, to help put a tight constraint on the occurrence rate of habitable planets and life. So that's what's coming. And I will finish there. <clears throat>
does not show what the earlier spectra do, which uh, I, you know, was sort of in the first third of your talk that showed, uh, uh, it, it, maybe I'm misremembering, but it, it seemed as though uh, the features were more pronounced in the mid-infrared than the near infrared. Right. So, so there are very strong features in the mid-infrared. And I mean, the, the reason I'm showing you this is just to show the signal-to-noise issue that we have. So at the shorter wavelengths, we're just more sensitive with JWST um, and potentially with OST as well as we, if we go into that sort of um, uh, regime. So it, we really are kind of covered by the instrumentation and sensitivity here, even though some of the features may be larger. And I was on the TBFI team as well, so I, I really I do love the mid-infrared also. Um, but let me see if I can find some spectra that you're talking about, probably the ones like what, what would we expect to see. So this sort of thing. Um, so, okay. yeah. 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 Right. So. Yeah. So these are really strong. Um, so yeah. So unfortunately, I mean, um, long word of two, two and a half microns or so. Long word of two and a half microns. Yeah. But I mean, we hope to getting out to sort of five as well. You have these very strong CO two bands in here. Um, also, um, yeah, they're great. But unfortunately, the, the instruments don't have at the moment don't have the sensitivity um, to do do uh, as well with those. Okay. So we need to. No, we're just we're just better off being able to observe down here. But yeah, there are strong features all the way through here, um, absolutely. And if we have the sensitivity to get them, then, then yeah, well, we'll I do should that. say, I've, in in full disclosure, I'm I'm on the STDT of origins, yeah, and and, and our our driving goal is to get down to five parts per million, out to twenty microns uh, for yeah. this very reason. Right. Right. Yeah, so I'm showing you simulations with JWST, and this right. is JWST's reality. Right. Yeah. So, so as to my other point about uh, to ozone? what extent is ozone uh, a good or maybe not so good surrogate? So, so I'm actually looking at that right now because I think that's an important question. Um, so I am a bit leery of ozone for the following reasons. It may be good, and I'm going to write the paper to see whether or not we can do it. Remember, I so said we had to infer surface fluxes and infer sort of the surface environment to try and figure out biosignatures and habitability. Ozone is in the upper atmosphere. You're observing it with transmission. It is also formed uh, non-linearly with oxygen abundance. So it has kind of a saturated zone where you can have like a huge range of oxygen abundances, but you still get the same amount of ozone from it. Um, it's inferring uh, abundances also from anything in the mid-infrared. Um, the actual thermal structure of the atmosphere uh, determines the, the depth and the shape of the band as well. So you need to also determine the thermal structure to be able to get out an accurate abundance. So it's, a, and, and I've got a student working on this now, which we're gonna try and do this and see how, you know, what with all of those sort of error bar things I've just described, how well can we actually pull out and say, yeah, this thing has, has high O2 abundance based on, you know, the ozone that I'm, I'm observing um, in this particular case, versus, you know, the oxygen and methane in, in direct imaging that really is just, you know, counting down through the, through the column. And it's a much cleaner observation than trying to do transmission of the upper atmosphere and then infer what's going on down below. But I will look at it. And because I think this is a really important question for that reason. Um, but yeah, uh, so it's also you can form ozone from other things. So, so, so photochemically, uh, CO2 photolysis and so on can also produce it. So there's a bunch of different ways of getting at it. There's some potential false positives. But I think it's worthwhile looking into it in more detail to figure out what's going on here. Thank you. Um, mentioned Javis, T, and Luvar. Have we given up on W first? It was supposed to have a pretty fancy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so W first, uh, last I heard, could only do like a couple of Jovians. That was the last I heard. So I think we have unfortunately given up on W first. Or at least I have until somebody comes to me and convinces me that I should care about W first. <laughs> It'll be important, the technology demonstration yes. of having DMs in space. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of the art, yeah. and part of it will be, okay, using those two Jovian <laughs> Uh, you know, examples, can we see, you know, what's the process, what are our errors, you know, what, what problems right. we encounter. So it's the pathfinder for the technique that we will ultimately use on, on terrestrials. So it's valuable for that reason, but I'm not simulating Pathfinders, anything for them yeah. or, you know, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, first, let me say this is a tremendous advance over the sorts of things we were seeing a few years ago in terms of justifying uh, uh, this kind of spectroscopy of direct imaging and so on. But, you had this number that if Louvois works perfectly but doesn't see a signature, then you put an upper limit of 6%, so roughly 1 in 20 mm -hmm. Earth's Earth like planets are can, uh, at most one, that 1 in 20 from the yeah, average. Mm -hmm. And I don't find that a very exciting number because it doesn't really tell us that we are rare. So the problem is Louvois isn't really big enough. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> but, so the I'm surprised you you argue that much. I know you are. It's a big shock for you, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, the obvious graph you had was where you had the off-axis uh, <coughs> sensitive number of, uh, of uh, Earth's detectable mm -hmm. as a function of off-axis and then on-axis. Yes. And the, the off-axis just stops at about, what, eight meters? And I wondered why the larger design was not uh, yeah, so uh, this is a function of how we actually did the study. Um, and so there is no reason that that should stop there. Um, that's, just, that's just how we did the design and the study. So when we did Louvoir A first, um, right. and then we were asked to do Louvoir B, and this was a very interesting design um, phenomenon, because when we got to the B, we were so disappointed with the yield, we were like, okay, well, how, we go, how can we you know, bring this up? And so we tried all of these different types of options. So the dream machine, you realize anything that's selected will not, we will not build either of these concepts, right? Anything that actually gets selected to go forward will be a completely different thing. But the dream machine would be the off-axis built um, you know, to the larger size so and using the innovations. <clears throat> I don't believe there's a technical reason not to. It's okay. just we simply looked um, at that. Uh, and we only did the off-axis for B. We did not do the off-axis for A. Calculation does it go up to like hundreds or? Uh, I don't hundred? know. I'll have to I'll have to ask Chris for you because he's the guru of all of this stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it, it turned out that B is actually the leaner, meaner machine just because we did all of these innovations on top of it, and so we want to apply the innovations of B onto A if we were going to be doing that. But I don't believe there's any technical reason for why that stops. It's just the study. We ran out of money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a question about this ocean detectability that you showed at the end with the, in small phases. How can you distinguish between liquid surface and ice? Yeah, so um, we do need to look at that. Um, ice, uh, ice tends to be, I don't know if you've ever seen a glacier, um, ice, the great thing about liquid water is it's, it's usually specularly reflecting most of the time, except you know in very high winds we get, you know, waves will actually change that, that reflectance, right? Um, Snow and ice tends to be, you know, sorry, ice tends to get covered in snow, which gets covered in dirt, and it's not necessarily always a very smooth, clean surface. Um, and so it's, it's less likely to speculatively reflect. Um, that being said, um, uh, Nick Cowan has looked at, you know, looking at brightness variations uh, for the poles um, as, as a potential false positive for this. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would argue that the water is definitely the most efficient specular reflector we might get out there. So we might have some less efficient specular reflectors. Um, I know there's also the potential for cirrus clouds to sometimes specular reflect um, as well. That isn't actually surface ocean water, but it's um, frozen up there. So yes, there are potential false positives um, for it as well. Yes, how have the HST transmission spectra of giant planetary atmospheres informed your models of, of these more terrestrial planetary atmospheric spectra? Um, um, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, we're working in a very different, obviously, atmospheric regime, so I think it would then go to the technique. Um, you know, the, the, what we've learned from doing the observations of the larger planets, mm -hmm. um, you know, has potentially then set us up nicely for trying to observe um, the smaller ones uh, overall. Um, but, but again, because the terrestrials are secondary our gas atmospheres, I'm not really dealing with anything that looks like, you know, a smaller Jupiter or, or anything like that. Um, I think, I'm just trying to think of this as a definite, definite correlation. I think learning about the scattering aerosols um, in the Jovians, uh, you know, also could potentially inform us about sort of scattering behavior seen in transit. Um, but I also like to say that um, we've we done a very interesting experiment uh, where we looked, uh, we used the Cassini occultations um, of Titan's atmosphere with the sun backlighting it as, as, a, as a simulation of the, the transmission spectrum of a hazy exoplanet, right? And so that actually ended up being a really interesting sort of analogous type of observation um, as well. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's the technique, um, and maybe some things like the aerosols are in common, but you know, other than that, we're working in a very different regime with secondary atmospheres. Um. Well, let's thank Vicky uh, again.